Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so excited. This is month five of the Lady Darby Read Along. Um, this month, we read A Pressing Engagement, which is um, the wedding novella. It's I consider it kind of Lady Darby 4.5 because <laughs> it falls between. Um, and I'm just checking right now to make sure we are live. And we are excellent. Good. And there. So. I'm going to talk about the book. Um, I'm going to share an excerpt. And if you have any questions or comments, please post them below and I'll be checking them through the night. I'd love um, to talk about whatever you want to hear about, not just what I think you want to hear about. So some of the discussion topics I'm um, going to ad address were brought up in the uh, read along Facebook group. So if you're not a part of that and you'd like to be, um, it's been so much fun chatting with everybody and just uh, interacting as we read. Um, I will post the link to that afterwards and you, please join. Make sure you answer the question so I know you're not a bot and I'll, I'll let you in. So first up, um, it's been a busy month. So I haven't, I was glad that this novella happened to fall this month because um, the Verity Kent book came out, Murder Most Fair. So it's been a little crazy. I haven't posted as much. Um, but this novella, for it being so short, it does pack in a lot. Um, it is the wedding novella. That's why I did it as an e-novella, um, because I couldn't write a whole book about the wedding, but I wanted to include it. Um, so I thought this would be a fun way to get to do it, because um, I knew a lot of readers would want to know what, what happens at the wedding. You know, don't we all about these couples that we really like? So this book also focuses a bit on Alyssa and Kira, and I find it so funny. When I was reading back through it, it reminded me that... I am way more like um, Alana because I'm so organized and like, you know, I want everything to be just perfect. And um, so when I was reading the book, I found myself, it's so funny, I write from Kira's point of view, but I found myself getting annoyed at Kira <laughs> on Alana's sake. Um, and I love hearing comments because I find that one, most most people take one side over the other and it kind of depends on what kind of personality you have. So it's, it's, it's funny to hear. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely more of an Alana. Um, I did get one question I was going to ask that, that a reader asked in the group and wanted, and, and I specifically said I would answer it tonight. It's, she said, books written about this time period almost always mention or feature the taboo of young unmarried ladies being caught alone, unchaperoned with a man leading to ruination and or a forced marriage. Were they really that obsessed about this then? Yes, absolutely they were, um, or at least the appearance of it. Um, the big thing for the upper classes was that they were guaranteeing the line of succession. So you didn't want a cuckold to inherit your dukedom. So that's why it was such a big deal. And they were so strict about it. Um, for widows and, and all that, and wives, it was a little looser. I mean, if you'd already had a certain number of children, but for those young debutantes, absolutely it was. Um, although also, interestingly enough, there was a lot of babies that were um, born at seven, eight months. So that tells you that people did, um, you know, get together, <laughs> get together before they married. So um, fiancés or, or what have you. So it did happen. Um, but yes, it was definitely a big issue, a big deal. So um, that's why it does, it does get featured a lot, but because it was so, it was a big deal at the time. So um, yeah, I also focus on this book a lot on, you know, Kira and in the previous book, Kira, you know, she's loves her independence. She's afraid of losing it, but she also loves Gage. And so there's that conflict and reconciling all of that and and getting herself ready to be married and to trust him that much um it's a huge step for her um another part of it that i almost did include was um the lord gage scenes um i actually didn't originally plan for her to kind of confront him i guess you would say um and then i thought i started it, it just popped in that it just felt right and i stuck it in and i was kind of i wasn't you know, she, she bluffs him a little bit. And so, you know, that's not something I necessarily would have been, would be brave enough to do myself, but it just felt right for Kira. And I love the way it turned out. And I thought that it kind of 
was a turning point too in her relationship with Lord Gage, showing that, you know, she's not gonna be cowed, I guess. So, um, and he he only respects strength. So it's an interesting thing, which actually I am gonna read that scene. That is the excerpt that I'm gonna do tonight. So um, bear with me a moment. When bearding a lion in his, in his den, it seemed wise not to approach without the proper ammunition. Fortunately, I had found it. It had taken me far longer than it probably should have to realize I already possessed it. But in my defense, I was not accustomed to administering threats or blackmail. However, for Gage, I suspected I would do much worse. His father received me in the study of the townhouse he had rented, seated behind a large oak desk. He peered down his nose at me over the hands he'd clasped in front of his chest like a magistrate considering a prisoner's sentence. I had expected nothing less, though gentlemanly conduct stipulated he should have risen to greet me. But if he sought to make me uncomfortable or intimidate me, then he had sorely underestimated me. So he sent you to plead for him, has he? He sneered. I should have expected as much. Actually, he doesn't know I'm here, I replied breezily, glancing about the room. I've come of my own accord. I turned away, strolling toward the glass cabinets filled with model ships. This home must belong to one of his friends from his time spent in the Royal Navy. I leaned forward, pretending to examine the model's masts and rigging. Gage tells us you won't be attending the dinner that Earl and Countess of Cromarty are hosting in our honor tonight, or our wedding ceremony tomorrow morning. I flicked a glance at him under my lashes. Such a shame. Lord Gage's eyes narrowed in suspicion. Folding my hands behind my back, I wandered further down the line of cabinets before breathing a resigned sigh. It was a struggle to keep my voice steady and measured when I spoke, ignoring my pulse as it pounded in my ears. I suppose that means you also won't be attending our child's birth or christening. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see I had his attention arrested. In fact, I believe that means you won't be able to see him at all. I swiveled to face him, staring him down determinedly. I knew it was a gamble to think Lord Gage would care about the lives of his future grandchildren, but seeing how Gage was his only child, I suspected it was a good one. What are you implying, he barked, leaning forward in his chair. Are you, his eyes dipped to my abdomen, I'm implying nothing, I interrupted in a steely voice, refraining to correct his misconception. I'm stating outright that if you choose to slight your son in, son in this manner, if you choose not to attend tonight's dinner or wedding, or our wedding, then you will never see your firstborn grandchild or any of your grandchild, children, ever. Lord Gage rose to his feet. Sebastian wouldn't dare defy me, not in this. I arched my eyebrows. Oh, wouldn't he? I could tell the moment he began to worry I might be right. His jaw tightened and the creases at the corner of his eyes deepened. After all, Gage had refused to return home to London, even after his father's repeated summons. And he'd rejected the bride Lord Gage had chosen for him instead of, instead of choose, instead choosing to marry me, a scandalous, troublesome widow with little fortune and no advantageous, advantageous political connections. But Lord Gage still did not relent, glaring at me in silent fury. I couldn't tell him, I couldn't let him know that I was lying, that the rumors currently circulating were not true, that, that even if they were, I would never have the heart to deny my child the chance to know their grandfather so long as Gage approved. I couldn't let him read that truth in my eyes for Gage's sake. I knew Lord Gage only respected strength. So I stood my ground and let him think whatever awful things he already believed about me were true, no matter how much it smarted to do so. Several moments ticked by, broken only by the marking of the grandfather clock next to where I stood by the cabinets. And yet Lord Gage showed no signs of relenting. I realized then that the man would never admit defeat so overtly. Perhaps it was his military training or simply his stubborn personality. Either way, the longer I stood there, the angrier he would grow at my refusal to bend to his will, and the more difficult it would be for him to yield later. It's no matter to me, I said with a careless flip of my wrist. I certainly won't miss you. If you want to be a complete fool, so be it. Then I turned my back on him and walked away. I had to be content knowing I'd done all I could. 
but that didn't stop the sour feeling of failure from filling the pit of my stomach. And as we know, he comes. <laughs> she busts him. Which also leads to one of the moments in the book I find I actually had forgotten about. And when I did my reread, I laughed out loud because when Earl Grey comes down and we know Earl Grey, there's a, there's a little subplot with him, the cat, and he flops underneath Lord Gage's chair at, the, at dinner and it's rolling around. And it's just, I, I first had forgotten I'd stuck that in there and it's just one of the funniest moments, I think. So um, let me check and see if there's any questions. Um, yeah, who wants to organize them? Yes, that's what I was saying. Some of you are totally are on curious side. So I always found that it was either you're on cheering, you're taking more of Alana's side or more of Kira's side, which is pretty normal in life. <laughs> we all have different personalities. So um Lord Gage, also I was gonna say, I had someone ask, he does make a fun comment about his family excuse me, at the wedding about being them being cutthroats and all this. Um, and I do have plans to visit the Gages or the Ross Carricks, his mother's branch of the family, or maybe both, um, in Cornwall. So in a future book, um, that's not in book 10 and it's not in book 11, but it may be coming up. So um, hopefully if I get to keep writing the series, that's definitely one of my plans that they're going to feature in a book. I think it would be a lot of fun, especially because Gage doesn't know them well either. So <laughs> it'd be an interesting moment. Um, Bonnie Brock is in this book. Um, it was a chance to get to kind of carry over his storyline and get to, he's so much fun just to get to, to do something else with him. And we get to kind of explore some of his background and that carries over into the novella for the Deadly Hours for next month. So. Um, there's a lot of focus on Bonnie Brock. Well, a bit in this book is not in this novella. It's not as much, but um, there was a moment that I love when they're handing over the journal to him, his mother's journal that she's gotten for him. And it's a vulnerable moment. And, and she gives him the journal and he, he, the look he gives her, she thinks to herself that she, it makes her want to shelter him too, which I find to be a really telling moment because we all have those things that no matter how worldly and whatever we seem, that we still are vulnerable and hurt. And so uh, I love that little moment kind of between them. It's just really brief, but it, I think it tells a lot. Um, I will say in the group, the Facebook group, I also share pictures of, of the dress that is inspires um, Kira's actual dress that I describe in the book. The one on the cover is gorgeous. I love it, but it's not really <laughs> the style of the period. So um, I do have pictures of that. I have pictures of torques because that's part of the book, um, which was a lot of fun to get to carry over that thread because I didn't wrap it up in a grave matter. And I thought, well, so maybe someday I'll just leave this. The, the a grave matter was already going on so long that I, I just couldn't add in one more thing. So um, I got to carry that over and resolve that a little bit too. So let me see. Are we ever going to understand how Lord Gage became so hard-hearted? Um, yes. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, he plays a prominent role in an upcoming book. So um, not book 10 because that's already written, but it's coming. So yes, <laughs> you will get to find out a lot more about Lord Gage and why he is who he is. And yeah, we're going to explore that side of everything. So we haven't done a whole lot. Um, we've see, seen him, you know, come to grips, I guess, come to an understanding a bit more with his son and with Kira. And then that falls all apart when they find out about Henry. But um, yeah, so there's more to definitely more to come from Lord Gage. Um, any other questions? And you still have time. Go ahead and pop questions or comments into um, the feed. Because I think I've talked about everything I was going to talk about for this book, and I've read the excerpt, so which is fine. It can be a short one because it was a short. <laughs> it is a fourth of a book. So, but if there's anything else you wanted to hear, um, I will give a second for those to come in um, next month. Like as I said before, we're reading in a fevered hour. My 
um, novella that's included in the Deadly Hours anthology. It's number, it's um, the second novella in the book, which is an excellent book. I, I highly recommend all the stories from all the authors in it. Um, Susanna Kearsley, C.S. Harris, and Christine Trent. And you should be able to find that anywhere. It's in print and on ebook, and it's at libraries if you haven't got a copy. So, and I know that it fills in some blanks for book nine. Um, yes, but it actually happens in the timeline between a pressing engagement and as death draws near book five. So we're going to focus on that book for next month. And the um, read along um, virtual event will be on October 13th at 8 p.m. So if you want to mark your calendars. And next week, my author chat is with um, Alyssa Maxwell and Clara McKenna, which will be wonderful. It'll be so much fun. It is on the 22nd next week at 8 p.m. also. So keep it, keep it out for that. Let's see. All right, here we go. More Marsdale coming. Yes, that is another thing that if I get to write more Lady Darby books, that is another thing that's definitely coming. I have plans for Marsdale. So the Ross Carricks and Marsdale are <laughs> definite yeses. And there's another one that's a definite, but I'm not going to spoil it. Where did you get the idea of getting the cat drunk? <laughs> I wish I could remember. I I needed something a little more lighthearted, I guess, I think, um, and just kind of bizarre. I don't know, it just fit. It fit with the whole atmosphere of it. And I can't remember where I got the idea. I know I got it from somewhere, but I'm blanking now. I probably saw it in something else or I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, but I didn't want the cat to be hurt too. So I was like trying to balance that. <laughs> um, will Kira ever address her husband as something other than engaged? She does it privately. Um, in that time period, it just wasn't common. M most women, a lot of women called their husband by their last name or Mr. or whatever or whatever. I mean, you see that in Jane Austen and all these other books all the time. Um, but when they're in private, she calls him Sebastian for sure. So um, that's really probably the only time you'll see her call him that. She just, she wouldn't do it in, in public in that time period. So in front of other people. How did you squeeze in these two novellas and not hurt your current stories? <laughs> it doesn't seem in search at all, thanks. Well, this one was written um, at the time between them. So it made it easy to fit it in. There was, a, there was a little tricky with the Deadly Hours story, but I knew, I guess I had kind of thought of it not long after and knew I wanted to insert it in. It just took a while to get that anthology done and published. So um yeah, I don't I don't know. I'm glad that it seems seamless. So I, I had to make sure about that. It would be really it was really a little tricky. Um yeah. So I think that's all the questions. Um I love joining you guys for these events and I hope you join us for the Facebook group if you're not involved and you're joining us in the read-along. This has been a lot of fun. And as I said, next month is in a favorite hour from the Deadly Hours and the author chats next week. And then we'll be move, moving on. So um, we wish you guys all a wonderful night and um, happy reading and stay safe and healthy.